All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider giving a thumbs up and subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcasting app. In this episode, I'm joined by Will Reeves. He's the CEO and co-founder of Fold, a company on a mission to bring Bitcoin to everyone through innovative and accessible methods. His experience in product design and user experience has made Fold a standout in making Bitcoin more approachable to the general public. And Will's known for his insights on Bitcoin adoption and his efforts to lower entry barriers for everyone interested in engaging with the best money to ever exist. I've been a fan of what Will is building with Fold, so I'm excited to talk with him again today. I think last time was uh, over a year ago, but uh, yeah, happy to see you again, man. It's uh, it's great to be here again. Long time coming, but I think we have a lot of good stuff to talk about. So. Yeah, man, as I said, uh, or as you said, you, you are a bit rusty when it comes to podcasts, but I think this is just a catch up of us and we're recording it. And then, of course, thousands of people are going to hear it, but uh, no, <laughs> no pressure. We're just uh, we're just catching up. Just two friends talking about Bitcoin. I mean, that's a day that's probably every day for both of us. So we sh I should be OK. <laughs> yes. We'll see. I think you'll be fine. Yeah. So from what I remember from when when we talked previously, you were somewhat of a Bitcoin OG, I think. Right. What was your first encounter with Bitcoin and how did it change your perspective on? Well, let's start with money. Wow. Um, well, first off, I need to pause and say uh, I reserve the title of Bitcoin OG for the giants on which I stand on their shoulders. So I, um, well, definitely there's been uh, probably 90% of the people that we currently interact with on Twitter or currently in, into the space weren't here even before 2017. And uh, definitely I have a few years on them. There's definitely people uh, who I consider the OGs and would be uh, uh, nowhere near that pantheon of uh of kind of uh, luminaries and heroes that have that have come before, but I think that's always the case, right? There's always the OGs that come before. Um, now, it took me a while to get into Bitcoin per se. When when I mean into Bitcoin, it's like I'm going to dedicate not only my savings into it, but also my time and energy. Which right now, I'm about as far leveraged long into Bitcoin as you could possibly be. I live on Bitcoin every day. Um, my company is a Bitcoin company. Uh, my friends are Bitcoiners. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's about as far on the spectrum as you can possibly get. Uh, but it wasn't always that way. And, you know, I think it's definitely been a journey of, uh, you know, education, of, uh, uh, of learning humility and putting your ego aside, because I had some of the most incredible experiences with Bitcoin in my early years um, before I got into it. I got to see... Um, how Bitcoin was being used as a as a means of uh, unstoppable remittances across borders to connect laborers and migrant workers in one country to their home country. Uh, and in a way that they weren't being exploited, I got to see that very early. I grew up um, in the Sonoma Valley and my, my primary first jobs were just working on wineries um, during the summers and harvest. And so I got to see quite a bit of that. Um, I spent time in Argentina and uh, through after one of their major uh, defaults, and I met people there who were saving in Bitcoin, uh, not using it for payments, but just purely saving it to escape the effects of um, devaluation and, and poor uh, monetary policy. And so all of these are and I was living in San Francisco and seeing people, you know, create incredible startups from the first early San Francisco Bitcoin meetups. You know, you have a lot of the people behind some of the most, you know, the largest international exchanges started there. Um, and that's where Fold started too, was, was in those early years. We actually shared office space um, with Casa and BitRefill um, mm. in the very early days. And so it was a very small spot, but going from those first moments of experiencing Bitcoin to, I'm, you know, I'm working on Bitcoin full time there. It took, it took me years. And um, I think that's, I think it's pretty similar with, with many people. Some people I've heard people say it needed to hit you over the head three times before you truly can fall down the rabbit hole. Yeah, I can certainly uh, attest to that. Like uh, 10 years on and off until I think the last uh, three, four-ish years that I've been really committed to 
to Bitcoin only, maybe even maybe even shorter. But yeah, the understanding comes in waves. Was there was there anything that made you like not get it? Can you remember what like was part oh, yes. of your dismissal own, at first? My own my own ego, my own ego, um, <laughs> my own you know thinking I am smarter or not understanding. So I think it was actually two things. It was both my own ego. It was also number. It was also not understanding the problem it was solving and thinking that the problem it was solving was something not relevant to me. I really came up and experienced Bitcoin first and foremost from a um, unstoppable payments and remittance perspective about being able to transfer value without intermediaries. I saw that in um, with the kind of situation I spoke about with migrant workers sending money back home. Uh, I uh, dabbled a little bit in Occupy Wall Street in Oakland and we were actually, all the Venmo and PayPal accounts were being shut down. And so we started taking uh, donations in Bitcoin. And I really just looked at it as this kind of fringe side, this tool for a limited set of people, but who really needed it. But maybe most of my life, I wouldn't need it, right? Being, um, you know, fairly privileged living in the United States at the time of, you know, and growing up in the 90s, when probably the last decade of full American, you know, uh, uh, ascension and dominance, um, uh, it just didn't feel like it was necessarily for me, uh, yeah. but I knew it could be valuable to other people. And so I think it was a little bit of that. It was also a little bit of my own ego about thinking I knew about money when I really didn't. Um, also a lot of smart people around me, uh, who I, you know, who I, I, I trust they've been also not getting. And so it was this kind of self-referential, um, bubble that you had going. And it was really only until you know, moments of meeting other Bitcoiners who had a different perspective on it and bringing it, which a lot happened in San Francisco at those Bitcoin meetups, meeting my co-founder, Matt Luongo, who brought his perspective, um, changed my mind. And a lot of it started to change when I realized, you know, hey, I, I'm i an entrepreneur. I, I'm always just going to be building things, bringing teams together to create cool stuff. Wait, I can do this with Bitcoin. I can run my business on this. That that skin in the game that both my money, my time accelerated everything. And so it started off with a curiosity, but went deeper. And I think one of the things that we try to do at Fold, because I think it is so powerful, is that it's hard for people to learn about Bitcoin and become convinced about Bitcoin by reading about it only. You, There's a moment where you just have to actually get involved. You actually have mm -hmm. to put some skin in the game. You have to actually have to start saving some of your your value in Bitcoin, where you really start to learn that in a way that just being told or reading about something is not going to not going to really get you there. It can it can prime the pump? It can do a lot of good, but there's a there's comes a point where you really need to jump in, and uh, that that can accelerate things and, and change that process quite a bit. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, BitGo, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast.
If you consider buying a foundation passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. I think a side question you said you, you were with Occupy Wall Street. I remember I talked to uh, Eric Case and, and he said when he, uh, he was kind of disappointed with the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement because like they understood the problem, they pointed to the problem, you just gave an example of you actually experienced, you know, your accounts being shut off, which I think, you know, is the, is the perfect example of what the problem is. Uh, and, and you even started using Bitcoin. Like, why do you think, uh, because what I got from Eric and, and I think I have the same feeling is like the, the problem is known for a long time. Right. Uh, but just camping outside and protesting like that doesn't really work like now. And I think you view it as the same, like you have to start moving. You have to stop, stop using this old fiat system and you have to start adopting uh, the Bitcoin system. Right. Like literally put your money where your mouth is. Um, how, how was your experience with with Occupy Wall Street or how, how do you look back on, on that? Time? I mean, I, I think if I look back at my my coming into my, you know, political self or what it, you know, uh, was a lot about, um, recognizing a problem and seeing a lot of people recognize the problem and having complete di you know, diagnosing in the wrong way of how we're going to fix it. Mm -hmm. And so I'd agree with Eric there. Um, and I generally think that's, if you look back at the, you know, a lot of the movements that have happened, that's kind of the thing that's gone wrong is that there's a real problem being pointed to, but the path to fixing it isn't there. It, it's wrong or it, or it's, um, it, it's, it's, it misfires. It's guides in the wrong direction. Yeah. Um, and there are some, there were some early, you know, some of my friends during the Occupy Wall Street, um, uh, timeline, they created a, a site called move your money. And essentially it was saying, Hey, opt out of banks, move your money out of banks and put them in a credit union. And so <laughs> it was, it was there where it was like, okay, we get it. We, we understand yeah. that where we choose to hold our value is a political action in and of itself. So that's that's yes. a very important step. Yes. Um, the second step is, OK, to to truly affect political change, you need to actually exit that and you need to put your go elsewhere. The problem was Bitcoin was nowhere on their radar as the uh, as the uh, of the place to actually fix it. And so this whole website was all about people showing they moved, you know, 10,000 of their own savings from Wells Fargo to, you know, firefighters credit union in San Francisco or so, you know, whatever it was. And so it was like almost there and it was spiritually in the right direction, but mm. the tool doesn't, didn't exist. And I think that's where Bitcoin is such an incredible thing. It is more than anything. It's just, it is a extremely powerful tool that can be leveraged to many different political ends. Um, and so I would, I would say, uh, the best thing about and why why Bitcoin is here and why I think it, the, its message is so salient today is because we have gone through two to three decades of identifying the right problem, trying a bunch of different ways to to fix that problem and all of them leading to either detrimental effects, uh, null neutral effects or no actual change is being done after that. And so we kind of we kind of pursued all the paths and now we're still left with Bitcoin. And I think people are having, you know, especially over the last five years, increasingly seen, especially over the COVID years and the money printing, uh, what a powerful counterpoint it plays to the existing system and what a, what a powerful tool it gives you to opting out of that system. Yeah. Well, maybe it's also that the, 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 the timing is better, right? Like, I mean, you, you have a startup background too. Sometimes you can have a good idea and a good solution, but the people aren't ready yet and you're too too early, you know, and a company still dies. Uh, although, although sometimes even 10 years later, a similar idea pops up and, and that works, right? Because the people are, um, are, are ready. I feel with Bitcoin, uh, I, I, I like how you illustrated it there. Like, I, I do think people understand the, the problem but the fact that it has been tried to to do something about it so many times with a lot of talking right i mean if you see uh what's his name Rand paul and you know like the libertarians uh libertarian politicians uh, early 90s they're already talking about 
the the deficit in America. You know, we need to change that. But but un- until that time, there wasn't really um, a tool that was totally disconnected with that existing system, right? And so there wasn't really anything to to actually get in into. You know, there was no lifeboat. So yeah, it's interesting to see now. I I feel also that why people currently don't see Bitcoin or or don't want to see Bitcoin is because it's been so, you know, how do you say, like um, combined with crypto and all the flaws in crypto and all the scams and all that stuff that, you know, crypto and Bitcoin bros and (laughs) we are all the same for a lot of people. But I think it's interesting because the the problem is bigger, way, way bigger than, you know, 10 10 years ago and way more prominent, right? Especially, and that's also why I want to focus on millennials, like starting a family, uh, uh, buying a house, like all these things that our parents and grandparents just did because, you know, have become way more unattainable for for a lot of people, you know? So I think the, the problem is way more prominent, but perhaps also Bitcoin as a solution is, once you dive into it, you will understand it's more solidified than, you know, yeah i of course i think you i think you said it right both on the timing piece that every problem you know every solution needs to be coupled with the right timing right the problem can always exist but without Mm -hmm. the right timing and set of circumstances the the solution's not going to achieve its full um uh you know potential and i do think the demographic shift that you're talking about is very important here and plays a big role where you know if you look at occupy wall street uh, it was uh, primarily, you know, heavily um, supported by millennials, but millennials at the time were not, you know, they weren't coming into their own of building a family, needing to build long term security for something beyond the next two years of their lives um, in a time when um, nihilism in their life about, hey, there's no jobs for me. The economy's bad. You know, it's going to get worse was rampant. Now you actually see people in a different phase of looking more optimistically. I have a family. I want to build something that lasts in the future for a long time. And there's really not great examples of how to do that in this new world that we live in. And uh, Bitcoin is definitely a tool uh, that we believe is central to that and so relevant to the lives of where millennials are today. You know, you look at uh, our, the first product that Fold launched was our rewards product. Um, one of the um, most powerful drivers of the success of that product is not just um, to earn Bitcoin rewards. It's it's coupled with the path, the the addition that our purchasing power in terms of the wages that we're earning versus how much and expensive things are getting has been moving in the wrong direction. And when you combine a reward on top of that that's earned in Bitcoin, you actually can blunt a lot of the major effects of inflation or the driving down of your purchasing power, because not only you're earning a percent back, but it's in Bitcoin, finite supply. It is um, an uh, a inflation resistant asset that is actually counteracting some of that. So actually Bitcoiners who have been using Fold for a long time, you know, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have earned more in their Bitcoin rewards than their peers do in their savings accounts that they've been saving their entire lives. Yeah. in their rewards. It seems silly, right? It seems silly that somehow the rewards could do that. Um, but that is true all the way down the stack. You're thinking about uh, mortgages. You're thinking about uh, saving for your family, about saving uh, investments, things like this. It goes all that's true all the way down the stack. Once you, for millennials to be able to um, integrate Bitcoin into their lives, is perhaps one of the most important financial decisions that they make yesterday. Not, you know, as, as it has to be as early as possible. And really, that's kind of been the driving light of where we've been taking fold is creating a banking experience uh, for this cohort, for these people that are coming into their own planning for a future and allowing them to to bank on the on money that works for them, a money that they actually um, that they prefer, but also giving them ac- access to all the financial tools they need debit cards, checking accounts, mortgages, insurance, loans, because we still live in this world, right? We still need to be able to interact. We can't all go, you know, full cypherpunk off the grid when we have our, you know, kids and we're figuring out what kind of elementary school or homeschool uh, path we're going to send them on. You know, we have to have a little bit more structure. That 
that has un, you know, kind of been the central guiding force about Fold is about creating this p- platform for people to maximize their financial life. And the only way to do that today is by integrating Bitcoin in some way, whether you're 1% or 100%, you got to have some skin in the game. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Once, once I realized what Bitcoin gives you in, in terms of actually owning the asset, right? Like, like when you look in, in your wallet and you see a transaction, you know, that, that when you are on the receiving end, that you really own it, you know, and that, that's what I also think that's difficult when you talk about Bitcoin, right? That is so, that's so conceptual. We don't even have to talk about Bitcoin, right? But if you say like, okay, what if, you know, there's a money that if you see the account, the, the, the amount in, in an app, that it's not just like a view, right? Like in your current banking app, the view of your your uh, the amount in your bank account is literally just a number in a database. It represents nothing. It's nothing. But if you see the number in a Bitcoin app, it's the real thing. You know, I love how Jack Mahler says like the information is the asset, right? The, the fact that you have the key to a certain part of Bitcoin also makes you have the asset itself like that that i think is part of the i like the word like the paradigm shift right like it's something that has not existed and especially because it's digital it's just really hard to understand even for millennials that grew up you know partially in in the 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 non-digital world and then of course also in the digital world and i i think that that is one of the big things people need to understand uh, that you know you can truly own the value that you yeah. got as a reward for your work. I mean, you you look at even millennials. So I I, I remember, of course, not myself, but those around me and you know, uh, college dorms and high school would be peer to peer sharing files back and forth. Um, yeah, and you know, we were native growing up natively. That was the primary way we were getting access to our content and media. And in some ways, um, it gave us it it showed us. Um, something true about the rest of the world where there is really no ownership, right? You can, things can just be shared and copied and inflated. Uh, yeah. And that's kind of true of the, you know, physical non-digital world. It's just, we haven't had that much access to really see it. Um, and that's why I think it took Bitcoiners like, uh, or people for Bitcoin to even have an even higher hurdle to jump is how many times have you heard, Hey, can't they just copy and paste the code base and create another Bitcoin or, How do you know someone can't just add more Bitcoin? You know, all these things to it, because we have real world examples of, you know, file sharing and things where scarcity for a digital asset wasn't real at all. And they were exploiting that massively. Um, And, you know, to your point of uh, that, that realization, the the weird thing that Bitcoiners go through is um, when your life starts to get more complicated. You have more responsibilities. You're starting to plan for longer periods of time. Traditionally, um, that has a, uh, an effect that makes people more conservative on the risks that they're willing to take when they have a family, when they are trying to plan for a long, long period of time. And people have asked me before, well, isn't that, doesn't that, you know, now that you have a kid and you're, you know, all these things are going on in your life now, don't you want to pull back from Bitcoin because it's so risky, it's so volatile. And in fact, um, my life has uh, only led me in the opposite path. The more that my life had put these responsibilities uh, on me, the more I wanted to plan for the future, I found myself adopting Bitcoin more and more and more. And that's a very counterintuitive thing for most people to know. But I think it comes back to exactly like what you said is if you can realize the core of it, that never, ever has it been possible to truly bear to hold your the value that you create ever and now you do have a tool for that it becomes the most conservative decision that you could make and that that learning curve is not widely understood because number one uh, people are not used to having such a tool in their life and a lot of the their understandings about bitcoin is just about its volatility or its riskiness or all of these other things that are essentially there to to scare you away from the essential insight that Bitcoin is the only thing that you can truly own. Yes. 
could not agree more, right? And I think especially when you have these life-changing events, right? When you have a family, you you need to secure or or lower your uncertainty around the future, right? Like that is that is the consequence of when you have a family to make to at least have an outlook on the future where you can build towards with your family, right? And I fully agree. For me, it's the same It's the same thing. You know, adopting Bitcoin is the most rational, risk-averse <laughs> decision I could ever make. It's, 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 it, it's the most predictable, most stable um, asset that, that you can own because... Anything about it, any underlying, you know, the underlying protocol, the rules, all these things you can verify for yourself. There's nothing that you have to rely on for, um, on, on another person. With with other assets, it's 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 only relying on other people. It's only relying on stories of other people or promises of other people, you know. And that is actually what is uncertain and brings risk, right? Because um, although you know understanding Bitcoin is simple, not easy. Like it, 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 it takes work. There, I think there's a clear end to understanding it. You know, if you do the work, at one point you will understand it. And I think, you know, with all these other assets, it's 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 just it's a they they are totally different games. And I think the abstractions and the obscurities that come with those assets are are there for a reason, right? So, you know, not everyone um, can get value from adopting those assets. And uh, yeah, I, I have exactly the same uh, thing for me. It's the most rational decision to make. And I think it's also why, you know, the people that don't see Bitcoin yet are actually way more pessimistic and uh, nihilistic, right? And they don't get kids and they don't get married and they don't start families. But we, we cannot really blame them because they are you know the 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 foundation of their life the 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 money the tool that they use for money uh or as money it's just very unpredictable so their future is very unpredictable right and yeah of course then wh why would you have a kid if you feel like your future you know although everyone's future is uncertain their future is probably way more uncertain and i think us by adopting bitcoin we we still have an uncertain future but it's way, way lower. Um, you know, I would say it's almost back to uh, the normal level of no one knows how much time they have in their life, basically. And that's it, right? Um, but we know that we adopted an asset to store our monetary energy in that nobody can mess with. And that, I think, is the main thing uh, that, that lowers that that uncertainty. So I, I think it's interesting you see it in the same way. I, I tweeted about this before, like... I am a risk averse person and Bitcoin is the most logical decision. I don't, I don't know how to explain it differently. Yeah. I, uh, I think it, the, the good framing that you said is that, you know, ultimately life is, um, is about managing risks in many ways. And, uh, <laughs> we have enough being people that rely on a heart to continue to beat, uh, is, is one of the most, um, you know, the, the, the one that just looms large. And if you're able to uh, put aside some of these um, other uncertainties in life, the ones that are actually maybe artificially created in many ways, like our money, uh, you actually get to just focus on the, 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 the aspects of life that, you know, you, you're not going to escape. We don't get to yeah. control how long we are here or our time or the things that could shorten that or lengthen it. Um, but just being able to focus on that, what does that ultimately do? It, it makes us think and desire to spend the time that we want in beautiful places with the people that we love. And that's a really uh, sober, clear eyed way of approaching life. And you really can't even get there if all your other life is just in chaos. And you know, you feel like you're constantly subject to rug pulls or built your, your foundation on sand. Uh, just removing some of these other uncertainties can can truly transform your life and it's not about getting rich it's about uh, it's about being able to see your life clearly and what's important to you yeah couldn't agree more so how do you experience talking to other bitcoiners uh, or other or, uh, other millennials i want to say you you just mentioned lots of your friends are bitcoiners so 
I think that's nice. But uh, how how do you experience? You know, my 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 others? life has really gone. Um, you know, I, I obviously there weren't that many Bitcoiners for for a long time, and you can find them at meetups or online. And but the idea of like a community um, that could make up the majority of friend group wasn't really there. Um, but I have a really rich group of friends that I have, and some most of them I would consider, you know, are probably only interested in Bitcoin just because I am. Um, but for the most part, uh, no, even the example of my life and what I've you know, talk their ears off and everything. They, they still haven't gotten there. A lot of them themselves, but, um, I, that's kind of part of the reason where fold even comes from is that, Hey, I, I'm not very successful at, uh, at orange pilling people directly full on onslaught. Maybe that's not the right way to do it. People need to come to it when they're ready. Um, and so I get love to maintain those friendships. I, uh, may have made so many friends in, in the world of Bitcoin, but, you know, even all, if you get too many Bitcoiners together, you're going to be, you know, your head's going to be spinning and be like, wait, didn't we just talk about that again? Because we, we, we circle, we are all kind of <laughs> refining these concepts over and over, sharing them, sharing them back. And sometimes you just need to take a break from it, even, even leaving this world and um, is important. So I'm, I'm, I advocate to have friends outside of uh bitcoin as well absolutely just for the, the health um of your life but um it's good having the balance to see to see both sides and i think it goes back to the same uh same thing we started this conversation off with i think every single one of my good friends uh understand the problem they deeply see that there's the, the problems that are there and they may have different language about speaking about it um and I think a lot of them have what they think is the solution for it. The problem is a lot of the solutions that they would point to are completely out of their control. It is reliant on some major political transformation of, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of people. It is reliant on some sort of collapse. And then from there we get to re rebuild. It's, it's uh, some sort of idea that, hey, I'm just gonna opt out and just live a life as minimal as possible. And that's how I'll control my risk and uncertainty. Um, but all of them are choosing things that, you know, are, are hard for you to control. Like you don't, you, that's not a lever you can pull. And the, so I think a lot of the things that I have chosen to focus on when I talk to people who are outside of Bitcoin is say, hey, you see the problem, you see challenges in your life. What are the things that you can do today, re not reliant on anybody else that could meaningfully make an impact? And that's where you do get some interesting stuff. And, you know, 90 percent of the time they're not talking about Bitcoin at all, but they're talking about, you know, eating better or being healthier or developing healthier relationships with those around them. That's all extremely positive, directionally correct things to do um, and much healthier than saying, hey, I'm going to live a, a, a life in this world that I don't agree with and that I'm, uh, you know, a victim of, but I'm only going to change it if everyone else suddenly decides to change it at the same time. That's a very unhealthy way of living. And so I, for me, it is really always comes down to, Hey, you know, we can bond over and agree on these problems, but what are the things that you could change in your own life? And actually there's a lot of great things outside of Bitcoin that are within your control. Um, yeah. and I think a Bitcoiners happen to also talk about those things too. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting once you see the problem and you know that you're living in a system, you know, where that creates that problem, you just have, you know, it's a fork in the road, I'd say, right? And if you don't, if you choose to stay there, right, like I always use the, the, the matrix example, like the, I like to eat a steak, you know, that, <laughs> the, that the, this guy wants to stay in the matrix, right? Because he loves the steak so much. Like it's, it's fine, but it will probably give you some sort of uh, perpetual anxiety, right? Because you realize that you have this problem and you cannot change it. Then you consciously choose to live with it, you know, like, so eventually um, I do, I do believe that people will turn around in a sense because you can only live with the problem of, you know, uh, unlimited uh, money creation and devaluation for a certain amount of time before, before you don't accept it anymore. Right. Yeah. Um, so you, you just mentioned it, uh, before, but I wanted to ask you, like, when did you really decide to contribute to Bitcoin and, and start a Bitcoin company and, and why did you commit to that? 
Um, so I had always been someone who I, I early, early in life, I, I got the bug that I want to be building startups and new ideas. I want to have small teams, think about big ideas, uh, pursue them, fail along the way, be okay with that and ultimately find success along that, that journey. That was just immensely valuable for me. I just loved that mode of living. Number one, you know, extreme risk, extreme high, you know, uncertainty, uh, but at the same time, total control over what you're doing day to day, like total control over uh, constant challenges being thrown at you. And you get to decide how you're going to make it, how you're going to route around it. How are you going to? And I loved that. I just, I love that. I loved being around people who liked doing that. Um, and I, I, I thought it was, it was something I knew happened, but when I got my first couple experiences, I was like, I can't believe this is a real way to live your life. This is so exciting. The problem was I, I didn't really care about a lot of the things that I actually was working on a lot of the problems that I was there. And, you know, my, my startup background is everything from, you know, social apps to e-commerce to, um, uh, peer to peer, uh, lending to, um, I, I've done car, car, uh, used car marketplaces. I've done insurance. I've done so many things, but I just didn't really care about the end thing. Like what I'm trying, I love the process. I absolutely love the process. Um, and it was only when I was in between, in between, um, uh, some of my projects and I was, I was working at a unnamed large tech company and I was in product there that I, uh, met uh, my counterpart who ran technology in the group I was at, and he was deeply into Bitcoin. And his side project that he was building was a Bitcoin startup. And I had by that time uh, kind of begun to fall down the rabbit hole in a big way. I was probably at where a lot of people get when they're maybe one year in and just every podcast, everything they've read, they're there, they know they can quote everybody. Um, and I just saw someone who was showing me the way, a successful way of living their life, both as an entrepreneur, building something in the teams, the way I like to live, but on a problem that I deeply cared about. And that changed everything. I was like, I can bring these two things together and I can provide for my family and I can still maintain all of this lifestyle that I love so much. And it was there that, um, you know, Fold came about and that's, that's, that's the origination. And uh, Fold went through many different chapters because a lot about being a startup is is figuring out what problem you're solving. Um, of a, there's maybe a big problem that you're going after, yeah. but ultimately you have to be focused on what smaller problem of that big problem you're solving. And uh, we went through a couple cycles, and you know ultimately you know found some great success, and that's what propelled me there today. But really, it was holy shit! I can live a life a day-to-day -day life that I want to do in pursuit of something I truly care about. That was, that was the win. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I, I also wanted to ask like, how, how do you look back on that decision now, but also what would you say to any entrepreneurial person, entrepreneurial Bitcoiner who's thinking about contributing to, to Bitcoin? What, what advice would you give them? Uh, First answer, I, I, I look back and I think, oh, I've been doing this for three years, probably. <laughs> it's a lot longer than that. It's, it's crazy. I don't like it's it's um, it has warped my sense of time because this space changes so fast and it is so brutal um, in many ways. There's it's hard to run a startup. It's it's extremely difficult to run a Bitcoin startup, number one, because your, your pool of Willing customers right now are smaller than of many markets. They also change and contract with market cycles. You're dealing with an asset that is itself undergoing product market fit, as well as your product that is related to that asset. So you're you have a couple things that you're um, you're accounting for. Uh, it is deeply political. It has been deeply maligned. It is. Um, it is hard to get partners that truly are in it for the long haul with you. So I can make partnerships with other companies that I need their act, their services. And, um, Bitcoin is in one day and out the other for them. They're not like a line for the long haul. So it's, it's just, it's extremely brutal. Um, 
But again, there's no more fulfilling path once you find that little piece of it that makes sense for you. And so for people getting into it, um, you know, I would say, uh, you know, there's a problem in traditional startups where, you know, there's a joke where everyone's first startup that they make is a local recommendation app or a some type of social app because that's just like where everyone thinks to go first and so you just get a bunch of people rushing to solve maybe something that doesn't actually have a problem but you know it, it's it's just a there's a graveyard of millions of you know these social startups that are there and there's in bitcoin you don't have that reliance number one there's a lot less money available to you uh you're going to have much more brutal cycles and the markets are going to be generally smaller and so what I like to do is, and my advice has always been, is look at um, what Bitcoin brings to people that cannot be solved anywhere else and go so much, go deep into that, whether that is unconfiscatable, whether that is bare asset ownership, whether that is unstoppability, whether that is just custody, whether that is, you know, there's so many angles you can go, but choose one and go really deep into it and become the best at that. And you know, sometimes with a, a space like Bitcoin, sometimes that's going to end up being a startup. Sometimes it's going to be a really fulfilling open source career where you are contributing and getting grants and there, and that's the best way for you to contribute. Um, there's just so many different ways. There's there's providing um, ideas and content and uh, helping others get educated on this is as important as building something, a tool for them to use. So yeah. Um, I'd say number one, be prepared for an extremely brutal uh, gauntlet. Be very open to finding where your piece is and come in with a broad perspective. There's a lot of ways to contribute. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I, I sometimes get these messages where people are like, yeah, I, I, I am a Bitcoiner and I want to contribute. Like, what should I do? And I always just say, like, just do whatever you're good at. Like there is so yeah. much uh, still needed to be done, right? And I think uh, it 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 it, uh, it does it doesn't even matter like where you where you come from. Like I talked to a guy who was a teacher, and I said, well, you know, if, if you like teaching, you know, there's a lot of people who still need to teach about Bitcoin, and there's all these different angles about Bitcoin. Like I sent him uh, to uh, you know BTC sessions uh, YouTube, who has three hundred thousand subscribers, mm -hmm. and he only talks about you know how does this software hardware work, right? And and I sent it to this guy, and he was like, "Wow, okay, you know, <laughs> this, yeah, this you is can what go I niche. could do. You can go specific. You can go you, very yeah. very niche. Yeah, 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 exactly. Or you know, for a specific target audience, or you know, well, that's what I'm doing a little, but you know." Any way you think, there's probably value in that, to be honest, right? Because we still have the majority, uh, you know, 99.9% .9 of people in the world to um, to educate on this. So, you know, any any focus is uh, is good, I think. I uh, I wanted to ask you about about fold where where you're at right now, but also a, a, a bit before that, you started with this. Um, you know, reward system. And eventually you also now can show the results, right? Of how people who save their rewards actually, you know, have more um, economic value or, or, or financial power than, uh, than other options. How does, you know, this gamified platform or app that you create, how do you think that contributes to kind of like broader financial education or, or understanding? I think it's, uh, it's hard to get people to care. Like we know about Bitcoin and money. It's hard to get people to care about money because everyone's taught not to think about money. There's mm -hmm. there, everyone's taught to think about everything else that money can do or what it gives you, but don't ever think about the money and that, right. It's a, and, uh, your finances are the same way. Your personal financial tools are the same way. And we've used education, gamification as a way to get you to focus more, to, to pay more attention to your money. Hey, come in every single day. Come look at how Bitcoin is volatile. Look at how Bitcoin is volatile to the upside. Look at, look at where you were six months ago. Look at the progress you've made six months. Look at where you would have been. And so gamification has been a powerful tool to get people 
to focus on the money in a way that's every single day. That was one of our things was, hey, um, sometimes Bitcoin conversations can come and they can go. But what could we create that has people focusing and thinking about Bitcoin every single day? And so that started off things with, you know, giving free Bitcoin to people every single day. Open the app, do it. That's another chance for us to educate them, to show them how where they are today is better than where they were uh, yesterday. It's better than the other options that they could have had. And so I think it's been extremely powerful in that, um, from that perspective. Um, and what it has also done is, is because we're getting this daily um, engagement, you know, we started off with rewards, very simple. Hey, instead of, you know, earning points or airline miles, earn Bitcoin. But the convert, once you're successful and people feel how powerful just changing their reward asset could be, they start thinking more. Oh, wait, maybe I should think about Bitcoin as my, my primary investment. We're not at savings yet. They're just like, hey, maybe I should you know, stop investing so much in the S&P or a given stock that I've been gambling on. Um, maybe my investment should be in Bitcoin. OK, let's we do that. Then we start showing comparing against the rest of the market to where they are over periods of time, how that could compound in the future if Bitcoin's um, uh, appreciation continues as it had. Um, then you get them to savings. And then you start to get this really funny thing where, wow, um, 80% of my net worth is in Bitcoin. And I never really made that decision. It just happened because the dollars that I hold in various things are just being devalued. That is just going down. And over the last five, six years, my Bitcoin has ballooned into a major piece of my portfolio. So we did a, a, um, a survey just the other day for our users and said, hey, You've been you've been earning Bitcoin and buying Bitcoin for a long time. Um, do you feel that you ha will have an urgent need for financial services specifically built around Bitcoin in the in the near term? And it was overwhelmingly 70 percent said, I will need a mortgage that involves my Bitcoin. I will need credit lines that involve my Bitcoin. I will need um, uh credit scores. I will need um, uh, financial advisors to recognize my Bitcoin, but none of the world does any of that. They all want to give you these very fiat um, credit products or credit scores, but none of it is focusing on that. There is a huge hundreds of thousands of people who now find their net worth is a significant portion related to, to their Bitcoin. And they will need, yeah. now they start asking, wait, the whole thing has to change for me. And a lot of these products don't exist. And what Fold has been able to do has been grow alongside of them. We started in rewards. We went into roundups and DCA and um, all these ways to accumulate more and more Bitcoin. And what you're going to see from Fold now is really taking that next chapter of, hey, we know you want to buy your first, your next home. Not because you think it's a big investment, but because you're building a family. Hey, we know you're going to need insurance. We know you're going to need X, Y, Z. And there's nobody there who's providing that to you in any meaningful way. And if they are, it's clunky, it's weird, it's expensive. It doesn't compete well with the traditional products. And what Fold is going to do is provide that entire banking kind of platform for you, but built for Bitcoiners, that yeah. you get an experience that truly leverages the power of what Bitcoin gives that you can't get from any other tool. And um, that's what you'll see us, I think, on, over the next, you know, few months and into 2025, we'll be focusing on quite a bit. We have a, a very fun roadmap ahead. So how, how do you see the relationship between Bitcoin focused companies like Fold and traditional finance uh, institutions evolve then like what I, I, I love? what you are building. I also really like on ramp, you know, this is like, you, you can build the bank of the future without, uh, you know, um, being a bank before, like you can, you can build a bank from scratch in a Bitcoin way. Uh, and I, I, I think it's interesting that current financial institutions, although, you know, some have ETFs, etc. like for them to reinvent themselves and become that bank of the future where Bitcoin it's not is happening. A, is they don't even core. realize, no. they no. don't even exactly. realize the problem yet. They don't exactly. exactly. It, we are well, we, because they profit from 
the problem exactly. we experience, right? Uh, yeah. So it's 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 a part of their business model. And our problem is that most people don't know that you know that is part of their business model. Um, so yeah, how, how do you see that evolve? I mean, I think just like Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin will operate kind of at the at the fringes. It's going to be most valuable to the people that are currently most under the thumb of inflation, of monetary controls, of unfair financial systems. Um, the inevitable thing is that problem is increasingly moving to the center, is eating the core of everybody. Yes. Um, and so the financial tools that are there to um, facilitate your usage, your um, experience of Bitcoin is it follows that same trajectory. And we have never been moving faster to the core. We have never been um, uh, more, the core has never been more understanding of the problem and awaiting a solution. And um, like you said, all the incumbents are too entrenched in not only profiting off the way things are, but even their approach to the problems, because they see it as well. You know, JP Morgan just today said, hey, we're going to start charging everybody to hold money in their accounts. <laughs> we're, go we're going to hold, instead of paying you an interest rate, which was the whole point of fiat anyway, uh, we're going yes. to now be charging you. And it's going to cause this paradigm shift where not only do people feel the heat from this general problem, but the tools themselves that have been used to facilitate that economy, it will be turning on them customers. It, they're going to turn on the customers. They're not going to be aligned. And what you're going to be seeing with Bitcoin focused companies who are building a world that not only is there to help them use Bitcoin, but reimagine the in financial and economic infrastructure in the image of Bitcoin will provide um, uh, um, uh, unfair advantages that even the core, the most normy core in the center uh, will not be able to live without. And they, that is going to yeah. happen very, very quickly. And, you know, we're already looking at um, some of the products that we'll be launching. Our mortgage product um, unlocks things like, Hey, uh, you can get a home that you want for no money down. You can get a home that you want that earns you Bitcoin as you contribute to your mortgage it actually increases your bitcoin stack or hey do you just want a lower monthly uh mortgage rate and you'll have a lower interest rate once you start introducing bitcoin into all of these financial products and services you get to create unfair advantages that the existing financial system um, not only increasingly has less and less of but increasingly is eating itself and again charging mm -hmm. you for having a savings account with them and that will inevitably hit a a breaking point and yeah. the incumbents will not be there to move fast enough to respond. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. I think this is really in line with my own TradFi experience at, uh, at two big banks. I, uh, I, I do not see them steering that fast, but mm -hmm. also just the... Uh, yeah, it's just the base layer values, views on money, all the mm -hmm. ownership, all these things are just totally uh, different than, you know, in Bitcoin as, as compared to traditional banks. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see uh, what, what you're going to build there. I have a little idea now, but uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm excited to, to see it unfold. No, that was a good pun, by the way, unfold. Um, yeah, so what, if... If you and and probably after you more companies you you know will start to build these services, how do you how do you envision you know Bitcoin integration into like everyday consumer activities? But also you know I like the quote that goes something like "Good design will make technology invisible." You know what what do you think is needed for Bitcoin to become invisible? Do you have any any ideas about that? Yeah, I mean I I think um, I think we're very, very close there already with what we built at Fold. So when you download Fold, you can um, uh, deposit your paycheck. It in instantly is converted into, into Bitcoin for zero fees. You're, you're, no, you're not losing any Bitcoin in that conversion. From there, your Bitcoin can immediately be used to pay a bill over the ACH network. You can use it to spend on a debit card. You can send it to someone peer to peer. You can keep it in Bitcoin. You can pull it out as cash at an ATM. All of this is completely under the hood. 
So essentially, you just can go about living your life and you look like a normal person from the outside. You're swiping a card, you're getting cash out of an ATM, you're buying a home, but all of it is built on top of your foundation on Bitcoin. And it comes with insurance assurances like good custody models for you. It comes with insurance on your on your on your Bitcoin. Um, it it creates an environment where you know all of the things that you were worried about holding Bitcoin are gone, and all the limitations you used to have by holding Bitcoin are gone. So we're we're very much there where you can live your life on Bitcoin, but be purely um, and easily accessing every service you need. What we like to say is live with the money you prefer but the financial tools you need and uh that's all to that exact quote you have we kind of abstract away all of it but it's very traditional looking banking experience and structure but under the hood it's on the a foundation of bedrock of bitcoin versus you know other other assets that you could choose to hold your wealth in i love the live with the money that you prefer that's great. I, I just had a conversation with uh, la last episode was with Scott Deedles and uh, we talked about, you know, the the currency that you are using, you in your country and me in my country, we never opted into that. We never consciously decided, you know, this is the money that I'm going to use. No, you know, when you were younger, you got some coins, you went to the store, you got a bread and, you know, ta-da, like that's how the money worked. You never questioned it, right? So ev even the fact that you can now say live with the money, uh, and now I'm butchering it, but, you know. <laughs> the, the currency the you prefer with the, the financial currency. tools you need, yes. Yeah. Exactly, right? Like live with the, with the money that you prefer. I The fact that that is even possible, I think, is the entire point of Bitcoin, showing that that is possible. And before that, you know, as we talked about, you know, people were aware of the fact that the money that they are forced to use is not good enough, but there was no option, right? And it sounds like... There's now really an option and also at, at a user experience level, you know, something that is on par with what some, with, with what people already know, right? So that can only be a positive, um, a positive, a positive development, I think. Um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to be mindful of your time. So, so wrap up with, uh, with, with three last questions, but I want to ask you, are there any other companies in the Bitcoin space that excite you? So the, the companies and the, the things that um, I think are the most important um, problems to be solving uh, are making custody uh, and improving the custody experience. So how do we get Bitcoin's core value proposition that we start at the beginning of the day, the, the call with of you know, Bitcoin is a bare asset. Just the fact that you can actually own it and um and hold that yourself without an intermediary is a revolutionary quality of Bitcoin. And I feel like that is a lot of times an underserved uh, aspect of Bitcoin. Now, it's great because Satoshi gave us the ability to hold custody over Bitcoin right out the gate. And it's been amazing um, and it's worked very well. But I think uh, companies that are working on custody and improving that not only how to custody yourself, but how to transfer that wealth to new generations with inheritance and things like that is an increase is, is such an important, uh, uh, thing to be working on. And so non-custodial products are huge. And so I, I love what, um, and that can come in many ways. I love what Unchained and Casa do. I love what wallets like Zeus, uh, do um, to allow you to hold in control of your money as well as be able to use it in your day to day. So I think that is uh, working on that. There's probably no better or more important aspect of Bitcoin than that, than contributing to making that better. Um, I also uh, think that, you know, a lot of the, uh, the, uh, user experience about living on Bitcoin and allowing people to use it as kind of a circular economy has been, um, a lot of um, the focus has been on custodial solutions that you know are available internationally, and I, I just I think that's great, and I think it's an important thing that's happening. But it's not the most important thing that Bitcoin is solving for. It, it you know a lot of in a lot of ways, 
custodial um, uh, experiences of Bitcoin in many ways are just degrees different than what we currently have versus non-custodial or self-custodied experiences that allow you to hold, send, and receive are, are the most important, but they get a lot less of the mind share uh, and discussion and funding, frankly. So I would like to see that change. I think there's a lot of good companies that are doing that. Um, and especially you're going to see a lot of these models uh, start to propagate in a very um, in a very kind of open source manner. And as we make some big breakthroughs on the user experience side, um, you're going to see uh, open source be able to do what it does best and replicate very, very fast and ultimately take over a lot of these custodial band-aids that we have around the world right now that people currently use. So I, I think there, there's no better place to put your time as an entrepreneur than helping people hold their money in better and easier ways. That's the most important thing of Bitcoin. Yeah. So is there any misconception that you wish to debunk? And how would you debunk it? Any misconception? Oh, my gosh. Um, I think the number one thing, and we've seen this, uh, you see this a lot in Bitcoin. Um, so there's a, a, a thing that happened in early, early waves of Bitcoin where some people got in so early um, and they miss... Um, they misappropriate their the randomness and aspect of luck that they were in it so early, and they misattribute that to being extremely smart or seeing something that nobody else does. And a lot of that um, moved into uh, them putting their next uh, their next project into weird places. Uh, a lot of it went to go, you know, propagating a lot of the scams that you see in you know, in the altcoin world um, said, hey, I was so genius to catch Bitcoin early on. Now, I'm, now I get to show my next project that's even more genius and it's better than Bitcoin. And, you know, there's just this weird thing that can happen when you're early to something. And I consider people who even adopted Bitcoin last year, the year before as early, is that they can get their ego back into clouding, you know, what Bitcoin is or where it should be going. And I think you're going to see a lot of that over this next year. You're going to see a huge push to change Bitcoin in, in certain ways for better or for worse. But I think it's going to be a lot of this is fueled by by ego. And um, if Bitcoin is uh, good at anything, it's smashing that. But it's also proven to us that it can take many years to recover from <laughs> very big successful movements based on this ego or this um, this kind of coercive approach to where Bitcoin should be. And we're definitely going to be experiencing that over the next year in a, in a big way. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I feel, and I think it ties into what we talked about, about, you know, the waves and timing. I, you know, if you are in Bitcoin for a long time and you know it for a long time and you're also a technical person, yeah, of course you could build anything on Bitcoin. But I think the main question is, should you, right? And um, I, I think the answer to should you is probably no, because with what it is right now, there's still so many more people to reach, you know, and, and, and we are already, uh, I like the analogy, like we are, we are already at game time, you know, at the end of a game and other people are still unpacking their shoes, you know, and if you're building all this other crazy stuff now on Bitcoin, it's like you're, they're still putting on their shoes and you're just off the pitch, you're shooting up a rocket in space or whatever that <laughs> you could be, right? But like, it, it shouldn't go too fast. It should go too fast just because you see it as one of the, I don't know, 20 people in the world that, that see a certain possibility to 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 build on or extend bitcoin doesn't mean you should i think and uh i i don't know if it was sailor who said like uh uh I, I don't know it's something with conservatism but i think i think i think um that's spot on like we should not ossify the code i think but we should take it slowly and it's very precarious right i think sailor has a great example of you know if you if you build that rocket into space you know even the tiniest bolt on the tiniest part of of a of a little wing has to be correct 
you know, if you move it a centimeter to the right and, uh, you know, maybe it goes off course and the entire thing explodes. And uh, I feel the same with Bitcoin. I think that's a good analogy, right? So yes, we should, we should keep building, but at a, at a very slow conservative, uh, conservative pace. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. You want to say something? No, couldn't have said that better. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, it is increasingly, uh, the, development of Bitcoin starts to look a lot like, um, you know, life uh, critical engineering problems. And it has been for a while. And we, some of the, you know, some people don't think about it that, as that way, but, you know, ultimately, you know, what do we all, what do we, what a lot of what we have just said, what this, what the space has said is, you know, Bitcoin is, is the, um, is where you should be holding the fruit of your labor to preserve time here. And that, what is that time? It's your life. And so, yes. um, there, there, it needs to have a, an approach that recognizes the seriousness of that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. All right. Last question. And I ask everyone the same question, which is what is a core belief that you will never let go? Oh, I think, um, and one of this is, well, again, related to what we we're talking about, I, um, I truly believe, um, uh, the, uh, a, a, a life path that is geared towards, um, expanding and, um, driving optimism in your life is, is, uh, the one thing that you should follow. So what, what leads you and those around you to a brighter, healthier, happier future, uh, is absolutely, um, uh, critical. And, you know, whenever you see yourself in any type of nihilistic or, um, or bleak, uh, understanding of the future, uh, that is a subject of you are probably not optimizing for the tools you have around you to change your situation and, and living a path where, Hey, if I'm not in a state of optimism, um, I, I have, I have, um, let go my own agency in my life in certain ways for someone else to tell a story. And so, uh, I'd say that's one thing I've always tried to pursue is work on things that uh, I believe drive optimism in my life and those around me. So it's, and, uh, you know, maybe some naivete is in there, but uh, I think that's required to, to make it through. Love that, man. Thanks for sharing. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I will link to, you know, your social uh, accounts, your uh, Fold's website, so people can check that out. And uh, yeah, man, appreciate you and uh, happy to, uh, to be talking again. It was great to be here. Always a good conversation. Cheers, man. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, check out some of my other episodes to learn why Bitcoin is the most important subject you must understand and adopt. If you want, you can follow and connect with me on Twitter X. I'm at Bram K, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you have any feedback or questions, just reach out. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for our next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.